Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is Sartre Row with LSN Tao. Um, I am here with William Guyton, and today we are discussing um, the LSC uh, baselines. William, would you like to introduce yourself for a second? Sure. Um, as Sartre said, my, my name is William Guyton. I am currently serving as the uh, Director of Information and Technology at uh, Legal Aid Services of Oklahoma. Excellent. Um, so a few quick things about the webinar here first. Uh, number one, logistics-wise, this is a smaller group. Um, I am happy to promote anybody up to a presenter so they can talk or unmute them. The default here um, is for individuals to be uh, muted, but since this is a Q&A, uh, feel free to um, type something to me either in the question box or use the raise hand function and I can unmute people. Also, if you have questions anytime throughout this, there is a question box. Um, I will be monitoring those and we will be answering any questions that are in there. Um, second thing is that this is being recorded. Um, we will be posting this to our YouTube channel. Um, our YouTube channel is accessible. It's in the upper right-hand corner of lsntap.org. Um, we've got over 200 videos uh, that we've done, including a whole series on security that uh, we worked on last year with Tech Roundtable. Um, all of our past trainings are made available to the public for free. Um, in the handouts, there are five handouts for this webinar. There is the LSC technology baselines that were updated in 2015. There is a call center triage. Let me actually pull up a copy of that here. Um, there's a, there are four guides that were put out in 2018, and I think that these are great supplemental readings for the baselines. Um, one of them is on knowledge management, putting together things like a brief bank, being able to share knowledge inside of your organization. Uh, the second one is on information security. Um, it's a tool kit that covers a lot of the uh, physical security and digital security items out there, mostly on the digital side of things. We just did a webinar uh, about a month ago on it. Um, we have one on online intake and triage. We've done several webinars on this topic. Um, and then we've got one on call center technology. Um, each of these are about 20 to 40 pages and they go much more in depth um, on technology and they were each published this last year. So although the baselines were written in 2015, these four guides work as very um, solid supplements to those baselines. Um, the baselines uh, that were published in April 2015 were an update of the 2008 uh, baselines and they had significant input from the community. Um, they go into a lot more detail also compared to what we're gonna discuss Today, today we're just going to go over a few of the basic areas and then hopefully get some questions from the community um, with regards to each of those. Let me back up the slides here. Presents. So one of the major things in the baselines is how to work on the long-term technology uh, planning and how to focus on the uh, strategic aspects of it, of hardware and software, uh, management for client data, production and supervision, of legal work, um, records management inform and information management, um, intake and telephonic advice. Um, so William, what is um, some of the stuff that you've worked on that you think is kind of essential on that um, intake or the ability to serve clients on the phone side of things? Well, we, <clears throat> the, my first real introduction to, to call centers was uh, post-Katrina in Alabama, where we spun up some call centers in 2005, 2006, specifically to handle the volume of folks that, had, that, w that we knew would have Katrina-related legal issues. Mm -hmm. um, so we got, we, Alabama got, got into online intake and uh, call center as a mechanism pretty much by accident because we had to. Um, the, the most important thing that, that we learned in developing that process was it really does take a cross-functional team. 
uh, it, it takes uh, it takes leadership. It takes attorneys. It takes intake staff. It takes paralegals. We we had one or two of just about every staff member in the program in Alabama involved in that process because at one point or another, each one of those types of staff are going to have to touch that online intake or do something with that with that call in the call queue. Mm -hmm. um, so I've this is my fifteenth year in legal aid, and I've I've watched it go from uh, a couple of different iterations of, of physical intake, online intake, callbacks, call-ins. So we've, we're, I think we're still experimenting on the best mix and match of those technologies and techniques as it applies to quality client service. Uh, and we're we're doing that in Oklahoma. We're we're experimenting with our legal server integration for online intake and. Again, doing some interesting things with call distribution using Amazon Connect to uh, to 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 route calls across the state to try to deal with the volume that we know we're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, so there there really is no one size fits all solution. It, it's a mm -hmm. state by state or program by program solution based on technical capacity and capacity in general. But there's probably not much of anything I haven't tried or seen in the last 15 years. So in, in um, kind of on the disaster preparedness side of things, um, what um, have you learned from that experience that um, could be done in advance that would have uh, made things much easier in the future? In terms of Hurricane Katrina? Mm -hmm. Well, I, there wasn't, I don't know that there was a whole lot we could have done because mm -hmm. we didn't really know which way the government was going to be shipping people out of Mississippi and Louisiana. <laughs> so Katrina impacted the entire southeast. There was a bunch of folks that got shipped to, to Houston and parts of Texas. So Texas programs got impacted. There were a bunch of folks that got shipped to Alabama and got shipped to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, so it, until we knew where people were going to end up going, um, we didn't really have a good idea of, of what to expect. Um, and, and then you've got the the long term knock on effects of that kind of disaster mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of foreclosure and family law and all of these knock on effects. We were still seeing cases three, four, and five years down the line after Katrina uh, because of just the knock on effects of of those legal issues. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in a statewide program, at least from a hurricane perspective, you can try to put assets across the state. If you're a localized program in New Orleans, and there there wasn't anything you could do, mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it's we didn't really have a sense of how many people were going where until FEMA said, "Hey, we're shipping, you know, fifty thousand mm -hmm. evacuees to Alabama." Mm -hmm. Now that that's a very good point. In in being a statewide program, you get a much more of an opportunity to be able to um, geolocate resources across yeah. uh, the area. And uh, in Washington State, we um, have put um, our phone system um, and our email system uh, both on the east side and on the west side um, of the Cascades here um, so that we've got some redundancy in those systems and the ability to keep it going if there is something on each side. Um, next area that we've got here is on staffing. Um, and this, uh, I was part of the process that helped um, discuss these, and this was one of the more contentious areas um, in just making sure that the that as your organization grows, that you've got enough IT staff. Um, in comparing this to what is out there in the general um, nonprofit kind of advice area, I would still say that the staffing here is is a little bit light in having two FTEs um, per hundred individuals. Um, those FTEs do not necessarily need to be in-house. Some of that can be um, an external help desk, um, but additionally, making sure that you also have someone at the strategic um, level of the organization that is looking at your um, longer-term policy things, that they're reviewing what your data retention policies are and data destruction. Um, that's something that the baselines doesn't uh, currently cover, but there is a session coming up at the MIE conference and um, right before, I, I believe it's called um, ITCon now, um, the new TIG conference, 
um, in New Orleans and data destruction is something we're going to look at there. Um, but making sure that you've got enough essential staff to be able to answer people's questions, help them with a uh, bring your own device policy, that type of stuff. Um, and as your organization grows or if it merges with other organizations in the state, making sure that that IT staffing um, is there. Um, so William, is um, how do you handle the um, IT staffing there? Well, we're, we're 180-ish staff mm -hmm. uh, and so we're currently at three and a half FTEs mm -hmm. and that and that really is it's based upon the fact that you know people want to go on vacation people get sick people have kids you, you, you always want a body on I mean if you if you're a program with one person then you know you're that person's going to get sick is is you know so one's one's pretty risky that's that's your all, all your eggs in one basket approach and, and some programs are small enough to do that um, but there's a, obviously a downside to having all your eggs in that particular one basket um, we're large enough and diverse enough and, and have enough people across the state that we're we're lucky we're probably above average in terms of bodies um, but we're we're doing a tremendous amount of technology in Oklahoma and no one of us knows it all. Um, so we, you know, obviously wear multiple hats, and we've we've got some cross training and some redundancy built into it. So if I want to go on vacation, um, I can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're we've lifted the entire program to the cloud. So even if I'm on vacation, I'm not really on vacation. In fact, there's mm -hmm. very few people in this day and age that are really on vacation unless they want to turn their phone off. Um, but again, it's 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 one of those cross-functional conversations you have to have with leadership, and it's nice that the the baseline has at least addressed it. Because I think on the first one, I don't know that it did. Right, so the you, first one did not cover uh, um, staffing issues yeah. um, in this type of detail. Um, additionally, we've got a question here: Is it common to have a consultant in addition? Um, to in-house IT. I'll answer that first. Um, at Northwest Justice Project, we've definitely um, used consultants for particular um, projects. And at other programs that I've worked with, especially smaller programs, they will uh, if they've got one person who is in-house, um, their second person is often um, a consultant or a um, help desk company or someone else that then um, supplements what that one person does. Um, I, I dealt with a program a about five years back that was about a 100-person program. They had one IT staff, um, and that person just left, and they had no idea even how the infrastructure was built, how they could support that type of stuff. <laughs> I mean, it became a crisis for them, and they, they ended That's up hard. having to spend a lot more money on consultants to come in and, and deal with the crisis of that individual leaving. Um, having at least two staff members that are aware of the IT infrastructure, the strategic plan, um, a the password management system. I strongly recommend LastPass, which <laughs> individuals can do for free. Um, I use an enterprise version for LSNTAP and everybody who works with me, uh, which allows me to um, instantly like pull all of the passwords from somebody when they leave for um, all of our websites, that type of stuff. Um, but just having at least two people, and even if one of those, if you're a smaller program, is someone external consulting that knows what your strategic plan is, when you need to rehire that tech position, um, it just goes so much smoother. Great question there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we've those of us that have done this long enough have all been in that same position. What what's what's the router password? Who who did this? <laughs> right? Why why where does that go? Um, but absolutely, um, we use Dashlane for the same reason. Um, mm -hmm. And you're you're using LastPass, and we've looked at LastPass. But not only do you get visibility into other secured passwords for critical infrastructure and, and that kind of thing. Um, for us, um, we, we use it as, as, a, as a tool to enforce our security policy, which is you need to have a unique strong password for every website and every account that you visit. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, and we've encouraged uh, staff to, to use Dash Lane for their personal use because mm -hmm. invariably their personal account will get breached mm -hmm. and they've, they've used that same password at some other Lasso account, therefore mm -hmm. we've been breached. Yep. So again, we're, we're trying to use the tool to raise all boats and to make it convenient to do the right thing in terms of password strength and, 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 that, and that policy aspect of it. Right, and I would, I would definitely recommend with regards to the password stuff, just do, do a training with and help staff set, a, set it up, even setting up a personal account. Because if, if they don't use it personally, the chances of them reusing passwords is really high. Um, yeah. Spend the extra time and help them create good um, security practices in their personal life also. Absolutely. Um, so budgeting, there's really three main things that the um, uh, baselines hit um, is ongoing maintenance and upgrades of hardware and software, uh, personnel consultants, and training in use of technology. Um, on the maintenance and upgrades, um, I, I've dealt with several different legal services organizations um, that kind of had the, well, we wait till somebody complains about their computer or until the computer crashes um, in order to save money. Um, but the loss of productivity of waiting on those computers is really, really high. Um, most programs that I know have somewhere between a four-year and the longest that I've seen is a six-year uh, replacement policy for um, desktops and or laptops. Um, and being able to rotate those through on a regular basis and not have to deal with crises when they crash can definitely help you a lot. Um, another question here that was back on the staffing. Um, is it common for an organization with 100 plus staff to have software, hardware, maintenance handled in-house. Um, a quick way in how Northwest Justice Project handles that um, is that some of our, some of it is in-house and some of it is um, external. So for example, with our call center um, software and when we were using SharePoint um, before we moved to 365 when we had it on site, um, we had external individuals who maintain those pieces of software and the rest of our software was in-house. Um, SharePoint just had, we had a lot of customization and it wasn't a skill we had in-house. When we moved to 365, we basically uh, dropped the customization and in a lot of different, both in using open source tools or closed source tools, um, I strongly recommend limiting the amount of customization that uh, you put into it so that the, when upgrades come along, you're not beholden to a, a consultant or an external coder uh, to make your customized system work with whatever the new standards are. Um, but yeah. almost all of our other software is in-house, um, although that has been recent. Uh, we are probably 150, almost 200 person org before we started to put all of that stuff in-house. Um, and we're at about 230, 240 currently. Yeah, and, and and we did the same thing. We've we've we lifted the entire program to 365 Azure, um, so we've reduced our on-prem footprint uh, mm -hmm. by probably 95 percent. Mm -hmm. um, so the the maintenance the, there's not any maintenance. The upgrades there's not any upgrades. Um, you you let Microsoft do that. Your budgeting is is fairly straightforward because you're paying a per user per whatever service that user has per month type of type of budget. So the budget should remain relatively constant unless you've got a, 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 a project or a program that you're deploying. Um, so our so our CapEx has been flipped into an OpEx in a big way. So we're not having to save $100,000 over three years to do a big server upgrade like we used to do you know, five years ago. Um, so the, the, the simplification uh, of all of that is has gotten has gotten very very good with uh, with 365 and Azure, so that really has a positive impact on the on the budgeting obviously, and it has an even bigger impact on the maintenance upgrade side because you're focusing on very specific things to your legal aid program versus Exchange and Active Directory and you know all the other things we used to do five years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, we evaluated going online. 
uh, five years ago decided to stay in-house. We are redoing the evaluation now. Um, the online tools have continued to significantly change um, over time. So I, I, I think looking at those cloud solutions and how much um, you're paying in-house to maintain those things is definitely worth it. Um, on the training side of things here, um, I recommend trying to put technological training as part of your regular like CLE schedule throughout the year and pair the tech training with another training that individuals are going to show up to. Um, we've tried to do like, here's just a tech training and the attendance just dives. Uh, but if we can get people coming in for something else and add on 10 or 15 minutes of tech training at either the beginning or the end of another substantive legal issue, we get much better attendance and we just try to keep it short and practical. We don't want people sitting around for an hour or two listening um, to security standards or something. We want some identifiable short um, tips that people can use and so they feel comfortable asking the silliest questions possible. Like just treat them well, answer the questions, help them out. Um, because when your staff feels comfortable in being able to ask those questions, they're more likely to ask you about that weird email that's asking them to click on stuff. Or uh, when they get a, a their computer is running slowly, then they'll come to you and you know, figure out what's going on. So just creating that uh, rapport is very, very important. Absolutely, big time. You know, ultimately, the, the, the technology department in legal aid is a support organization. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're about supporting staff to av advocate for clients. And mm -hmm. you, you've got to remember, remember your role in, in, in within the legal aid organization for sure. We're in the same vein. Um, we find ourselves having to do the same training over and over and over again, depending on which office you're in. Mm -hmm. So we've 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 taken to uh, developing very short videos that we upload to the video section of SharePoint, and so if you went up to our video section of SharePoint, you'd you'd see from very basic stuff to some fairly advanced stuff. How how do I log in? What happens when I log in? How do I load Skype? Where's my headset? You know, mm -hmm. it, we we took it from an onboarding perspective because we were we we were redeveloping our onboarding process. So we looked at it from an onboarding uh, staff member's perspective, and and you know what are the what are the five things you need to know when you sit down at your new job at Legal Aid? You know what mm -hmm. are the five people I need to reach out to? And so we pro we approached it from that perspective, and it's grown kind of like the LSNTEP video library over time, where we record the CLEs now, and the mm -hmm. CLEs are up there by subject matter and by location and by date, and it's just mm -hmm. and and you know we've 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 made people comfortable in terms of the open source tools and you know webcams and headsets are inexpensive now mm -hmm. and the ability to to have a subject matter expert sit down and do a 10 minute teaching session on some complex legal issue is really impactful um and because you've got it in the can you can point somebody to it um mm -hmm. And we're developing those on a on a uh, on a vertical basis as well. So family law will have their own section of videos, uh, you know, those kind of things. So we mm -hmm. we took the video approach just because we kept hearing the same question. Uh, so we got a question here, uh, William. Uh, would you be willing to share some of those onboarding videos? <laughs> uh, sure. Okay. They're 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 not glamorous, um, mm -hmm. but uh, there's no reason why you can't have access to them. Okay. The you know at the same time we we do a a about a quarter about once a quarter we do a Midwest IT directors conference call so mm -hmm. all the all of the directors in the Midwest part of the United States get on a call and do this same kind of thing that we're doing today and we've opened it up to just anybody so if mm -hmm. if, if you want to pick the brains or or talk about a specific subject. Uh, within legal aid technology, we're we're doing that on a regional basis because it's, you know, we no, none of us know it all. Um, mm -hmm. and there's some really fantastic people and great ideas, and we need to uh, we need to leverage all of those ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's the great thing about TIG. I steal most of my ideas from TIG. Well, and if if there is 
um, a piece of technology or something that you're using in your program um, that you would like us um, to either help you create a video for or uh, create a short five minute video for, that is definitely something you can ask um, LSNTAP um, to do. Uh, we would prefer to uh, collaboratively do it so that you get the skills um, to do future right. ones. Um, but then we will take those videos and share those uh, with the community. Um, we were working on one um, currently uh, for um, LastPass uh, because we're encouraging staff to use it. Um, but that, those type of short videos, um, do not worry about the production cost. Uh, right. It is more important to keep it short, simple, practical, um, and that is going to go so much uh, further. Um, yeah, it we, does not have to be flashy. Yeah, we don't do. We ten minutes is our max. If you if you can't if you can't condense that com, concept concept down into ten minutes, then you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and we use uh, OBS Studio. We've got mm -hmm. OBS Studio loaded on a bunch of machines specifically to encourage uh, folks to capture that because we. You know, time is limited, and we all get the same mm -hmm. question. You know, yeah. advocates, the advocates get the same questions. Leadership gets the same questions. I'm like, take your expertise, boil it down to 10 minutes, and and, and put a video out. Yeah, and I'm going to drop a link here in the chat to OBS Studio. Um, I've, I've used it for streaming and for other stuff. It's very, uh, very powerful open source software um, that allows you to do screen captures, video captures, um, it, it's great. Um, definitely recommend it. Uh, I got another question here. Um, uh, how, how do you guys handle um, hardware maintenance at your program? Well, we, from a from a desktop perspective, we have a thirty six month four year replacement schedule for mm -hmm. for desktops, mm -hmm. um, and we we just went through a major. Um, hardware upgrade. In fact, we've got two more offices to visit before the end of the year. In fact, I'm heading to Muskogee, Oklahoma mm -hmm. tomorrow mm -hmm. to, do, to, do, uh, to do phones and, and security cameras. But the, it, 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 as Sart alluded to earlier, it's significantly easier to, to develop a replacement schedule than to figure out five years down the road that you have to replace an entire office worth of machines. Mm -hmm. and, and the negative impact of on on that staff's product productivity and their morale is, is going to be in the toilet. I mean, yeah. you, you gotta you you have to if you want good quality legal aid out of support staff for clients, you've got to get a you have to give them the tools that they need in order to be able to supply that high quality legal representation. There's just no way around it. Um, and and we're so you know. We're so technologically focused now at the court level, at, at the legal aid level, you know, being without connectivity, being without a tablet, being without the right software is is in a lot of cases a, a disservice to, to, to the clients we're, we're, we're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. so we, we, we budget, um, we do, uh, and, you know, within that budget, since we're on the budgeting page, we, we budget for disasters. You know, mm -hmm. what do we do if the roof blows off an office? What do we do if an office burns to the ground? What do we do if, you know, you, you, you can't budget yourself to the penny and then not, not be able to respond to some emergency? Because invariably over the course of a year, there's some emergency at some office somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, but that's, you know, you have to make it part of your, and that's part of the reason the baselines exist, is mm -hmm. you need to be able to articulate what this document is recommending as a good as a best practice for a legal aid program mm -hmm. and you'll have you'll have leadership that push back on that well we simply can't afford to do that and then that that opens up that conversation about well what type of service are we willing to give clients mm -hmm. great and and finding the practical impact examples um, of these things um, does tend to work better with the uh, executive directors and your uh, leadership staff um, when, when you end up having uh, PCs dying or other things, um, the impact on clients is really high. Um, so as kind of a follow-up to that, it was um, does your uh, in-house staff in, install software, that type of stuff on new PCs? Over here at uh, Northwest Justice Project, um, we've 
basically um, got, have a five-year uh, replacement program and, wet, and we do go through um, and install the software, but we pick up a series of computers that are the same. We set one of them up um, and then we replicate that setup on all of them. So the, the having a, a bulk um, process for doing that and having it as part of our um, annual cycle um, cuts down on the time and the cost of doing those because uh, we're not loading up every computer and then installing one by one uh, each of those things. But yeah, we do do it in-house. Yep, and we have a similar approach. Um, we're we're a big we're a big Amazon Smile customer. I mean, most most everything ninety eight percent of what we purchase is is on Amazon Smile, and mm -hmm. so we've done our testing. We've got a base package. This this is what your your you know your new hire staff member is going to get in terms of the assets. Um, here's the desktop. Here's the laptop. Here's the phone. Here's the headset. Here's the webcam. Um, software and, and the software in the OS side has gotten easier only because we're really digging into the Intune aspect of Office 365 mm -hmm. where we can start to automatically deploy and give staff access to the apps via 365 and ultimately if we uh, continue to work with Intune it'll have that same kind of impact on the security side in terms of mobile device management and endpoint deployment and notification and those kind of things. Uh, in fact, I'm looking at uh, uh, conditional access. So you can now put a policy in place in Intune that won't give somebody access to email if certain baseline uh, criteria have not been met. Uh, so at Intune at a buck fifty, the nonprofit price per user per month is, is a has turned out to be a real asset. Mm -hmm. uh, literally, uh, because we use it for inventory mm -hmm. as well. So so we're, again, we've done the whole Office 365 Azure thing, so we've, we've had a big helping of the Microsoft Kool-Aid, and part of that Kool-Aid is, is using Intune to, to manage your devices. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a follow-up question here is who handles uh, procurement um, for IT? Um, so at NJP, we... Um, have a, a budget um, overall of what we're doing. And then our um, head system admin um, currently uh, covers all of that with oversight from one of our executive team. Um, we are in the uh, next year going to be hiring our first um, chief technology officer um, that those responsibilities um, or at least oversight uh, will move to that individual. So the long-term, um, there, there will be somebody on the executive team there. It's currently overseen by a member of the executive team, um, but there is an uh, annual budgeting process and then also um, check-ins on that budget throughout the year. Yep. We're, I'm, I'm a member of the executive team, so as a director level position, I'm that technology representative at the table. But at the same, at the same time, um, we have a uh, a CFO and we have a formal budgeting process and I'm the person that's held responsible for being over or under budget on an annual basis and um, we I sit down with the uh, the CFO uh, quarterly and see where our spends are you know I'm, I'm over on hardware I'm under on software I'm over on services you know so you get you get feedback and reports that show you where you are uh, on your spend, and that all ties into your technology plan and what do we want to do in year two and year three, what do we anticipate as a, as a big technology project. They all tie together because obviously without the financial resources, and it also dovetails into consultants, if you don't have the, if you don't have the internal capacity to, to develop that particular solution, then you may have to hire a consultant to help you deploy a particular technology solution. So the budgeting and the technology planning and, and the leadership all, all dovetail together because they all impact each other. I think you're, you're muted, Brian. Hey. There you go. Uh, so sorry. case management. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> not a problem. It's all good. Um, so case management systems is kind of the next thing that we've got here. Um, 
uh, we uh, keep a list on LSM tab of uh, case management systems. Um, the features do tend to uh, change on a regular basis. Um, these are some of the major systems currently used, um, although Salesforce um, should probably be added to this slide, as I know a few programs have started to use um, Salesforce also. Um, the uh, feature sets for the case management systems um, are also when uh, they get upgraded for a, a single member of the legal aid community, those get pushed out to everyone. So we're having discussion. I know one of these case management systems has upgraded recently to make it easier to do data destruction. Um, and there's talks about doing it um, for other case management systems. Um, but the, um, the ability for staff to be able to access them from multiple locations, um, your report functioning out there uh, is very important. And then the ability to um, share those uh, case information that you need when transferring it or sending it over to other programs are some of the fundamental pieces that are really in there. Um, so William, in, in looking at a case management system, what are kind of the major things that um, you look at and what uh, was a deciding factor in the case management system you're using? Well, we've, I think I've done three conversions now between three different CMSs. So I've, I've been through the good, bad, and ugly of just about each of these on the screen. Um, it's, you know, for us, the, the watershed moment was when you went from something like Kemp's or Pico, which was really client server based. And if you weren't in the office, you didn't have access to it. And there was a time when, when we knew that we were going to have staff representing clients that needed access to that data. And really, we spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort trying to figure out how to take what is what was traditionally a client server architecture and virtualize it and put it up in the cloud and give people access to it. And in most cases, it didn't seem to work very well. So we ultimately went with a legal server primarily because it, it, it's specifically written for legal aid organizations, which in and of itself is, is unique. Uh, although Kemp's did that, and Pika did that to a certain extent, um, but its 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 biggest selling factor is accessibility. It, it's a web-based application, and more and more of the grants that we're competing for at a regional and national level require an embedded staff member, um, and you you're not going to be able to support that embedded staff member in that hospital or that domestic violence shelter the way you support a staff member that's physically in one of your offices. So we had to we had to think about, you know, how do we support a staff member that's not physically in an office anymore? And that really drove us to, to, to Legal Server and to Office 365, uh, which gives everybody the ability to get to everything they have regardless of wherever they are, which is a which is a which a, which allows a lot of people to, to especially in, in Oklahoma, um, you know, we're, we have some pretty dramatic weather events, and invariably we've got Internet out at an office somewhere in the state probably every day. So, the, so from a disaster recovery capacity, but more importantly from a, from a staff accessibility capacity, um, that's what really sold us on legal server. Yeah, we, we are also on uh, legal server. Uh, part of it is that our whole state um, is on legal server. Um, all of our volunteer uh, lawyer programs and the other uh, legal services orgs, um, which has made it easier to transfer um, files. I do think there is a, a need for a case data standard uh, that was interoperable between all of them uh, because the lock into a particular um, system uh, I, I think is a, a long term, it uh, prevents kind of uh, competition and others entering that uh, marketplace. Um, that's not something covered in the baselines, but it's one of those things that um, could, uh, would be useful. Um, another question here is, um, who does your um, RFPs, bids, solicitations, et cetera? Um, so at, at NJP, we've got a policy where um, over $25,000, we have to uh, do a competitive bid process. 
Uh, we write the RFPs in-house. We often ask the community on the LSNTEP email list, does anybody else have an RFP here? Um, we occasionally also, um, actually in our last uh, two RFPs that I've been working on, we run those RFP also by the TIG staff um, because they've seen so many RFPs. Um, they're willing to just um, make improvements, give you feedback on an RFP to help improve those. Um, and then we uh, post them publicly. We've got a um, RFP board and job board that was launched in the last six months on LSN tap um, where anybody can post an RFP. Um, let me see about bringing up a copy of that. Uh, but it also, it covers um, jobs also. Um, Additionally, we then send it out to an email list that is everybody from the LSNTAP community, and then we contact vendors one-on-one, -on -one and we look for email lists or community groups that deal with those things. So with our last Drupal um, upgrade, we reached out to a bunch of different Drupal developers and some Drupal email lists to kind of share that broadly. Um, how do you guys uh, do RFPs, bids, um, solicitation, that type of stuff? Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a similar approach for us. Um, we, we don't have a lot of projects anymore that, that hit the RFP threshold, only mm -hmm. because a lot of what we're doing is, 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 is a per month, per user service type of charge. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably a consequence of being in the, the 365 Azure orbit. Um, there's, there's not a single huge $30,000 project anymore. You know, most of those were done several years ago, like the case management conversion and uh, some other things that we did in the past. Um, we, we just don't see a lot of very large dollar-denominated projects anymore. Um, they're really just made up of, you know, clicking this box and saying, we'll sign up for Intune for 30 days and evaluate it, and clicking this box and clicking this box. It's, we've, we've decided what our technology architecture is going to be which right now is Office 365 and Azure. Um, and we know what our base hardware and software package is going to be for a given staff member. So most of those, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room, at least in the last couple of years, because one of, the, one of the major benefits of a platform like 365 is we've been, there have been, significant incremental improvements in all of the 365 services over time that haven't cost us any more money. Um, so it, the, the, way that you, the way that you budget and plan for technology in a cloud-centric environment really doesn't lend itself to those large denominated projects anymore, if that makes sense. Definitely. I mean, the, um yeah, moving things onto um, a uh, per user or monthly or yearly basis definitely changes kind of the threshold there. Although um, even when we're picking up services like that, although we don't go through a formal uh, formal RFP process, we right. definitely do an in uh, comparative analysis. Of oh yeah between yeah. what's available out there and that type of stuff. So I think still having a process that looks at the features, looks at the costs, and looks at the impact and compares it um, is very, very valuable. Um, up on the screen right now, I've got the uh, job and RFP board. Um, so if you're looking to hire more tech staff or if you have any RFPs out there, um, please send it to us along with a close date. Um, we will put it up there, we'll share it widely, and then we will also uh, remove it uh, when it's done. Um, but we we want to help share those things as broadly as possible. Um, the next area that we've got in the uh, baselines is uh, the basics around supervision. Um, it goes into a pretty good amount of detail in the baselines, but kind of the five things we pulled out of it here is um, calendaring. Um, that you need some type of software to be able to do that and share that and let people know when people are out, that type of stuff. Uh, document production, timekeeping. Uh, most of our case management systems have that integrated. I know a few programs use external timekeeping apps, so um, supervised data and then online research. And there are a lot of different approaches that I've seen programs take. 
Um, some of them go an entirely um, uh, open access, um, free tools that are online and train individuals on that, which often uh, takes a little bit of training because um, law schools typically don't um, teach how you can get access to pretty much all of the case data out there without going through some of the other services that are out there. Others do it with a uh, Westlaw or Lexis or one of those type of accounts. Um, uh, William, do you guys use anything um, on the software side for um, supervision data, for um, checking in on people, seeing where cases are? Is that all in your case management system, or how do you do that? Yeah, yeah those, those are reports. Those are canned reports within Legal Server. Mm -hmm. Although we are talking to Ed about some of the the dashboard management tools that he's talking about. He's got a TIG to, to do some of the the dashboard stuff that we're interested in in uh, in looking at. Have you seen what Ed's Ed's TIG grant? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I, we we did a short highlight on it, and hopefully we'll be able to do some more. Um, yeah. Um, electronic records. Um, this is one of the areas that um, the baselines covers a little bit, um, says you need things like a document retention policy, policies regarding access, uh, which is really part of your security also, and confidentiality. Um, the one area that's kind of missing, and I think that uh, whenever the next update is, we will definitely have a section on, is kind of um, what exactly your digital destruction um, looks like. It's slightly covered in the document retention. Um, but there is a need in the community to find better ways um, to get rid of pieces of data that you no longer need. If you've got a 10-year-old closed case, um, you may need a client's name with regards to a conflict check, um, but still having pieces of their medical record or uh, personal information related to that case, um, the longer that you hold on to it, the more likely it is to end up in a data breach. And I wish there was a way that I could tell you how to prevent data breaches, but they're going to happen. It's a matter of time, no matter how good your security is. We can do a lot of things to cut down the uh, likelihood, uh, but one of the best things we can do is regularly purging data that is not needed, that you don't have a business case or a um, client responsibility to hold on to. Um, what types of policies or procedures with regards to electronic records do you have, William? We are, they're, they're, they're being co-developed as we deploy um, Intune and some of the uh, compliance tools that are built into Office 365. Um, we're, we're starting to have that conversation. Um, it's, it's, we're getting down to the point where we're having to uh, tag data and qualify data, and, and based on those tags and qualifications, we get to determine via policy in 365 who has access to them. Do you have the? Should you have the ability to print this data or download this data? Uh, should you be able to email it and forward it to somebody? You get a you get a lot of uh, digital rights management ish type uh, tools with some of the security suites built into. Office 365. Um, a lot of that's coming from our friends in Europe because of the data standards they've enacted. Um, and but there is a fairly, as clear as it can be, approach that Microsoft maps out in terms of the like the, the life cycle of a, of a of a particular piece of data. It, it, it's a work in progress. It's 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 a heavy lift, and we're still getting the infrastructure and the training and the policies in place to be able to do it well. Uh, but it's it's part of our data architecture that we're working on. Excellent. Um, I know that um, John Greiner um, has is working on a. It's not model policies, but it's more things that you a bunch of questions you should ask for creating uh, particular policies. Um, that should be out early next year. We did kind of a preview of it yesterday in a webinar, 
Uh, but once the kind of toolkit there is done, we will do at least an hour, hour and a half long discussion around that topic overall. Um, also, there, uh, at the pace that we're going, we're probably not, well, given 10 hours, I don't think we could hit everything that's in the baselines. <laughs> but if there are questions even outside of the particular area that we're looking at currently, um, or comments, please drop those into the question or comment box. Um, we are definitely happy to cover different areas. Um, on the knowledge management side, um, this is an area where um, the baselines cover a little bit. We're looking at about a page, two pages of some simple text. But this is somewhere where I really encourage individuals to pick up um, the handout that is, I believe it's a 33-page document on knowledge management. Um, covers everything from brief banks to uh, sharing letters to uh, anything to, where you're trying not to duplicate work or you're trying to um, share internally the knowledge that your staff has over particular legal issues. Um, I think what, what William has done with creating some short videos from experts um, so that if you've got an AmeriCorps fellow or you've got someone coming in that they can get that information as soon as possible and know who the expert is in your organization, that is essential. The particular software or hardware that's used is less important in my mind than the community management aspects. Um, we launched a SharePoint site. Um, to be honest, half of our org um, uses it very, very actively, and another half doesn't use it at all. And the big difference there is the, the portions that have used it, there's been someone in our um, telephone hotline area or in the practice area that has really taken it on and decided to shepherd it and talk to people about it, um, where in the other areas, no one had really championed that. And if you can find some individuals who are willing to champion that, the, the management aspect of finding those community managers um, and giving them positive feedback and showing them how useful it is, um, I'd say it's more important than whether you build something on Drupal, Drupal, whether you use a Google search appliance, whether you use SharePoint, there are several other tools out there. Um, the tools all at this point have very good search uh, that can be put into them but it's making sure that good documents go up and that only good documents stay in that and that individuals put into their daily workflow sharing that knowledge that they're creating for clients. Any tips on like putting together knowledge management systems or things that have worked or things that have failed? Uh, one other thing, I, I have seen um, knowledge management systems that tend to go outside of your organization um, do tend to have challenges when it comes to um, redaction, confidentiality, that type of stuff. Um, putting those together is much more challenging than doing it internally. Um, Next area that we've got here is statewide websites. Um, and we've got um, several different ways that those have been done in smaller states. Um, we see a uh, very uh, basic website um, that is often built on um, something like DLAW, um, which is a free open source distribution of Drupal. Um, I've seen a few particular programs or even parts of programs um, create a WordPress site for particular issues. Um, I've seen that happen definitely in the veterans community from time to time or for particular service areas. Um, uh, Pro BonoNet also um, provides some very robust um, statewide websites and Urban Insight on top of the DLAW template um, does a hosted version called Open Advocate um, that several different programs uh, work with. Um, putting together a way to manage what goes into or comes out of um, the statewide websites and when they get updated um, is extremely important. Um, we've got uh, basically two FTEs 
um, in Washington State that update um, the website. One of them is more on the tech structure side and the other one is a content editor that creates that content. Um, one of the things that isn't heavily covered in the baselines but um, I think should be um, added is making sure that whatever you're putting out there on the website that you have client user testing as part of the process. Both tests, can it be found online? And also, does the materials that you're creating create the knowledge in potential clients uh, that you want it to? And uh, we did a bunch of focus group testing on some videos for part of a TIG grant, and we found that there were a lot of what we thought to be very plain language things that were still embedded in legal terms and that the uh, that we could significantly improve those videos by going through a round of user testing. Um, any thoughts with regards to statewide websites? Um, one of the areas that the, that the new baselines added um, that was not there before is the legal information, social media um, side of things. And most programs at this point have some presence on social media. Um, I definitely recommend um, short videos for YouTube for common questions that come up. Uh, a lot of individuals are going to be seeking assistance outside of the business hours of your um, hotline or of your office, and YouTube's available 24-7. Um, Facebook also now has an autoresponder option. If you've got a Facebook page, that is an area where we get a lot of people asking us questions. We put together an autoresponder that sends them to our online intake. Um, we did test a chat bot um, that would interact with that, that would try to serve them resources from our a statewide website also, depending on what it thought their legal issue was. Um, that technology was a little bit clunky, but it has a lot of potential. Uh, if you can go to where your clients already are, instead of making them come to your statewide uh, website, uh, you're, you're able to reach a lot more individuals overall. And going to the clients is really one of the things that uh, the baselines looks at looks at when it's incorporating social media. So it's not just a broadcast that we've got a clinic here or there's this informational thing going on or here's where our offices are, um, but also providing a way for them to get access to your self-help resources through those is uh, definitely beneficial overall. Um, there's a little bit in the baselines over uh, pro bono support. Um, but integrating that into your technology systems is definitely essential. Um, and then uh, we talked about this a little bit in the budgeting area, um, but those continual trainings are also um, essential, making them part of what you're doing. Um, additionally, one of the areas that we've seen a little bit of a lack uh, from time to time is the training for tech staff also. Um, most programs do have a standard area where they um, cover CLEs, continuing legal educations for legal staff. Um, I would, although it's not required for tech staff to keep a license, um, it is essential for them to be able to um, update their skills. Um, send your tech staff to one or two tech related conferences. Make sure that they have access to online tools where they can get education and access to community to update their skills. Um, they will be much happier and much more useful as they update their skills, and that should be part of the training. I recommend um, considering shadowing what you offer for CLE training to your um, tech staff as part of a budget for them. Put that in that for each person, we've got X number of dollars for each tech staff member to be able to do this type of stuff. Um, and I would also rotate uh, tech staff through e either the Equal Justice Conference or the uh, Technology Conference from LSC, um, because both of those conferences have a dedicated um, technology legal aid um, side to it. The TIG Conference is obviously all tech, but um, Equal Justice Conference does have 
um, at least one and sometimes two tech panels on every single spot. So very useful for tech staff also. Um, on the security side, uh, once again, I recommend the um, 2018 security toolkit because it goes so much more in depth into this. Um, but the four major areas that the baselines cover is maintaining backups, updating your software, educating staff, and then limiting permissions and access, and especially having a process in place for when all of your interns go, um, when they leave, uh, when we uh, bring in interns or fellows or pro bono staff, um, not always with pro bono, but at least on the ones where we have a limited time, um, we get that end date at the beginning of the process and we set those calendars that we're cutting off permission or access at that date. We will send an email to their supervisor at that point in time and make sure that that person hasn't extended because about 10% of the time somebody stays on or they still got an active case or something. Uh, but having that proactively from the beginning um, eliminates the outstanding accounts somebody forgot to tell you so-and-so was leaving. I would also consider having kind of a yearly audit where you go through and double check all of your accounts and make sure that they're still active staff because you'll find some accounts out there that were just missed for one reason or another. Now we talked to, uh, this is an interesting one. Um, so William, how do you guys cover uh, bring your own devices? You know, I, I, I sound like an ad for Microsoft 365 um, <laughs> because we're, we're, we're testing and deploying Intune uh, almost specifically to manage BYOD. Um, the, we, we encourage staff to, 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 to use their own devices, to bring their own devices, to connect to, to Lasso resources by any device they want to feel comfortable with or have access to. But that's a double-edged sword, obviously. Um, so part of what we're doing with Intune and the baseline policies that were that are being enforced by Intune go directly to setting some baseline standards for all the devices that we have access to. Um, so you know, so the the Android devices, the iOS devices, um, the the Chrome OSs, the the Windows devices. There, there's a policy and sub policies uh, for each of those devices. So um, we're we're beta testing the rollout of iOS now. Um, we've enrolled a bunch of people. The endpoints on their device, and it's only on their device because they downloaded the Outlook app and connected to their mailbox. Uh, and when they did that, the endpoint got put on the device where we could actually audit the device to help us set our baselines uh, for each device type or each operating system. So that's that's the approach we're taking is we, we don't want to limit anybody from accessing the data they need in order to advocate for clients. But we do need to have an, a, the ability to set some baselines uh, and, to, and to enforce some policies just from a risk re reduction perspective. Or with regards to Northwest uh, Justice Project, um, we um, are have developed a policy. Um, I will share that out um, a little bit more broadly. Um, we do have the ability to remotely wipe individuals um, who have installed um, the Outlook app. Um, if they are just accessing their email, though, through a web browser on their phone, uh, we do not. Um, we strongly encourage people to both install the Skype app um, so that they can do calls from their cell phone that go through their regular um, phone number instead of their personal cell phone number um, and the Outlook app so that we have that ability. Um, we don't sit down with everyone and, and double check that, but... Um, that is definitely what we encourage uh, out there. And um, additionally, with regards to um, laptops, 
Um, we do have a, a policy that if you're going to be doing anything that accesses client data through your laptop, that we set up a VPN um, for you, and we approve those on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, seeing that our case management system is accessible uh, via the cloud, um, we also have a um, separate policy for telework, and for telework, um, we require uh, an antivirus um, as part of that, a computer at a, at a certain level, and um, IT staff to have the ability to kind of review what that is. Um, I, I, I've seen some programs that will just uh, provide the computer um, to use in that remote work situation as if it's a home situation. I think that gives you a, a lot more control. Um, uh, it does occasionally mean that someone has two computers um, at home, uh, one that is their personal computer and one is the computer that they are using uh, for case-related data. Um, but I, I think that long-term that is the, the better uh, policy because it gives you a lot more control and you don't have to worry about external software or other uh, things that individuals are doing with their own devices. Um, Uh, backups, um, we've definitely seen a lot more organizations moving towards the cloud. The um, over um, the baselines do not uh, specify whether you should do on-site or uh, the cloud. Um, either way that you do backups, um, it is essential that you test these on a regular basis. Um, we've definitely seen um, some problems with some of the case management systems in the past where they've gone down and the backup wasn't able to recover stuff. Um, backup was sitting there for five or six years and had never been actively tested. I think you have to go through a process of making sure that the that whatever system you have in place that it works. Um, get your IT staff together, take a, take a Friday or take a Saturday and pull everything down and try to pull it all back up and see what happened or see if you can pull up that backup uh, to it. Um, well, when I took over LSNTAP, um, we were using a hosting company um, that literally had all of their backups in one closet and they lost everything uh, that we had early on. Um, we have switched entirely to a very professional hosting company that has um, a backup service and we've tested it since then and we have lost uh, no data in the last seven years. Um, but yeah. Any other advice with regards to backups? Uh, we talked a pretty good amount about training. Um, uh, there's a, a bunch that is covered in the communication policy, although this also, uh, this is one of the areas that is really important, especially when you include social uh, social media, have a uh, system in place for um, what is posted, what isn't posted, and who will review something if you have any questions. Because as you empower staff to be able to share things, uh, which is very, very useful, um, just make sure that those uh, processes are in place. Um, this is one of the areas that I know the least about. I've only dealt with the one uh, telephone or the two telephone systems we've had here at Northwest Justice Project. Um, we had an on-site um, telephone system that was literally dying when I got here and we replaced it um, with a Skype system that um, has had some minor hiccups, but once we got through that, um, has worked extremely well for us. Um, the toolkit that is on here for call centers does cover a little bit about telephone systems, um, but it is uh, it is covered heavily in the um, baselines. William, do you have any advice on telephone systems or um... sure? Well, I was I was in a similar situation both in Alabama and in Oklahoma. The, the same situation that you found yourself in, I found myself in here where the PBXs have been hanging in the DMARC for 10 or 12 or 15 years and, and literally, literally pieces of them were failing. 
So you'd, you'd lose the voicemail card on the PBX, and you wouldn't have the ability to leave a voicemail anymore. Um, so the at the time I got <clears throat> excuse me at the time I got to Oklahoma, that was pretty much the situation in every office. It was the same PBX. It was the same handset. They were about the same age. They weren't under contract. They weren't being maintained, and so there there wasn't really a good on-prem solution that we wanted to go with, which again really pushed us to the cloud as, as, as a solution. Mm -hmm. And then it became, which cloud VoIP provider do you want to use? And we spent a good six months testing about a half dozen voice, VoIP providers and initially went with Dialpad, which we still have some, off, some offices on Dialpad. And it's a great product and a great service and it's competitively priced and, and it's been reliable, but um, it, it, it doesn't have quite as tight a, a level of integration with Office 365 that Skype does. Uh, so we evaluated Dialpad versus Skype and decided that, that, uh, that we, we really like the, the tight integration of Skype for Business with Office 365. Um, so we've we've begun to deploy Skype for Business instead of Dialpad. But right now we're a little bifurcated. Um, but we will we will take the offices that we moved to Dialpad and convert them to Skype offices in uh, in 2019. Excellent. Um, and with regards to tel telephone systems, um, this is something that. If you have any questions, I would really encourage asking on the LSNTAP email list. Um, there is a, a lot of programs have went through very intense um, RFP processes, redesigning and redoing, and there's a lot of knowledge there. Um, that is um, definitely if you are looking at two or three different systems, um, you can find people who use pretty much any of those systems on the email list, and they'll tell you what went well and what didn't. They'll also give you uh, feedback over vendors, because putting these systems together is very expensive, and there are vendors with very good reputations, and there are vendors that people have lost a lot of money and abandoned systems on. So definitely get, and, get a hook and on one, that. Yeah, and one of the big changes um, is that both Dialpad and Skype, and I would imagine most of the other other VoIP vendors, will let you go month to month. Um, you, you don't have to commit to a long-term contract, contract like you used to have to do. Um, so you have the capacity now that you didn't just a few years ago to actually spin up an office or a few volunteers on Skype for business with both a, a headset and a physical phone, if that's the route you want to go. We, we spun up instances of 8x8 and and Ring Central and Jive and, and Dialpad and a bunch of other vendors. Um, and actually, I mean, until you put an ear to the quality of the call and look at the feature set and develop what you're what you're willing to spend or what you can spend from a budget perspective and what features you have to have and what features are just nice to have, um, you can you can narrow down that vendor choice. Um, in that same vein, we decided to go with. Um, Amazon Connect as our call center software because neither Skype for Business nor Dialpad really gave us the control we ultimately thought we wanted with our call routing as it related to online intake. Um, so you're, it's going to be difficult to find a one-size-fits-all solution, but with only a 30-day commitment on a per-user basis, you don't have to make that one-size-fits-all decision anymore. You can mix and match different services based on on your on your needs and your budget. We lost your uh, audio, sorry. Uh, um, so two questions. That, thank you so much. Um, is there a resource on how to implement Skype? Um, for an on-premises system that you would recommend? There, there are a, there's a laundry list of resources that we use for, for both VoIP and 365. Um, I can, in fact, I just provided the list of a lot of the, the blogs and uh, video resources that we use at Lasso uh, about 365 and Azure and Skype specifically. 
there's there's a tremendous amount of documentation on on-premise Skype from Microsoft. Um, Microsoft is is the documentation is pretty good. It may be outdated, so you can use the documentation generally as a baseline, and then go find some authoritative resources, primarily in third-party bloggers, that will will give you the correct recipe for a specific implementation case. Um, so it's really a mix of a bunch of different types of resources. Microsoft is pretty good on the planning side and the and the big picture side and where their documentation seems to break down is I mean their documentation doesn't seem to keep up with the pace of their development. So invariably you're trying to solve a specific problem that they haven't that they don't have good documentation on. Uh, but invariably the the blog postings of their development groups are are very informative. They all have communities focused around specific products and services that you can become a member of. And there's a lot of additional resources like uh, Microsoft Academy, Developers Academy, uh, what is it, Channel 9. But I'll, 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 uh, I'll send SART the uh, email of resources I sent to the, the Midwest uh, IT directors group just recently on some of this stuff. And we're discovering stuff every day. As you, as you Google a specific use case, you'll find somebody else in the Netherlands that has this elegant solution for something you've been knocking your head against the wall for a month. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of resources, and that's good and bad. There's a lot of mm -hmm. bad resources, but but we hopefully we've figured out the ones we trust the most. Excellent. No, we'll we'll put together a separate blog post for those resources and just make them uh, publicly available. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so I'm jumping to our. Uh, resource slide, um, which will also be available in the blog post. Um, it covers a lot of the different things that are out there. Um, and we will make this whole uh, list available. Um, additionally, I definitely want people to know that um, our YouTube channel has videos on pretty much every topic uh, that is covered in the baselines. And if there is not a video there, please feel free to email me. Uh, we will create a video or we'll put together a training and we'll find some experts out there in the field um, to help share uh, whatever is going on there. Um, we've, looks like we have covered all of the questions. Um, thank you so much, William, for co-hosting this with me. Um, Absolutely. I, I like what you're doing in, um, in having kind of that uh, director's call and sharing knowledge on a regular basis. Um, we'll look at our schedule with webinars next year and see about putting together like some type of a national like quarterly um, thing, uh, probably on a different piece of software so that everybody could uh, talk so that it's a little more interactive. Um, but I, I really like that because just having those discussions with other professionals is one of the best ways to share knowledge. Yeah, um, absolutely. It, it's a great asset. No. Um, this is the last webinar of the year. There's going to be a survey going out uh, within the next day or two uh, because we just released our RFP for what webinars you want to see next year. Um, as that survey comes out to everyone, please fill that out. Mention the topics that you want. We're look, going to be looking at different vendors. Also, if there's anyone that you think we should reach out to uh, with regards to doing a presentation, uh, there'll be an option there in that survey. Or if there's something that you would like to present on, um, send a, your, we'll collect contact information through that survey, um, and we would love to have other experts uh, from the community uh, present. Thank you all so much. Greatly appreciate it.